Okay. Good morning. It is a pleasure. This is kind of nice. I may have to try to do this more often. I kind of like coming in and greeting y'all. A uh, couple of announcements, though, before we begin our time together. Um, I want to... I'll go through the business, and then we'll get to the other stuff. First of all, what's next weekend? Daylight savings time. Do we... Do we lose an hour? Do we gain an hour? I don't know how that works. I, I, no, I, I refuse to learn how that works. <laughs> Somebody will tell me when I need to be here. But y'all, make sure that you get here at the correct time because uh, next Sunday, we are doing a youth Sunday, which basically means that our young people are going to participate in our worship service. And, and Carrie's going, uh... <laughs> It's going to be awesome, uh, and we want to support them in that and, and, and thank them for their willingness to come and, and do that, and it'll be good. I have no idea. They, they did, I am going to uh, share the message, so I'm hoping that that works. It'll all mesh together flawlessly, I'm sure. You Sunday next weekend, uh, we want you to, to come out and, and be a part of that. Um, on the more delicate or, or sensitive or or I don't know what you'd even call it, the sadder side. Uh, we received word on s- Saturday that Marion Mitchell, uh, dear sister, passed away. I mean, those of you who are on the email chain, you are, are aware of this, and we're so glad to see Floyd and everybody for the family here today. It is, uh, thank you for coming and allowing us to share this day with you, and we're grateful for it. Uh, services will be announced when we get the the details finalized but it's looking towards the end of the month is what we're hoping for right okay so uh do be in prayer for floyd and for the whole family um what what a sweet lady we're gonna miss her um i also want to remind folks to pray for stacy wymore our secretary her dad is uh being uh gonna move he's moving quickly towards a quadruple bypass um, that's uh, uh, a little dissettling for her because she's here and he's in Coeur d'Alene. But now she's there. She uh, said, I don't know what I should do. And I'm like going, why are you even asking? Um, you need to go and be with him and uh, spend that time with him. It's a, it's a significant procedure, so be praying for Stacy's dad and for Stacy for protection and their whole family. Just want to bathe her in prayer and, and him as well for healing. So... Those are my announcements. We are not here for announcements, even though they are an important part of our life together. I want to invite you, if you would, to turn or just listen to the words that uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in the first letter. One, I hope, that is so familiar to you that you can maybe even recite it along. Chapter 13. Beginning in the first verse, he says, well, you know, I have to start in the previous chapter. Strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, 
I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three And the greatest of these is love. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, your great love inspires our love. We can get impatient. We can be less than kind. We get trapped in envy or boastfulness or arrogance. And so today, Lord, we ask for a full measure of your love, something that you have promised to give us in abundance so that we may see a little more clearly, a little less dimly, so that we may see what is really important. We thank you for the way that you've gathered us together today, that we can worship you, hear your word, and we pray that your blessing would be upon our time. In the name of Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Let's all stand and sing, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad.
you just hang on. Yeah. In our Bible study for the adults, we're talking, we're looking at Revelation, and there's a chapter we looked at today that, that has two responses. There's a, there's a calamity that happens in the world. The, the Babylon the Great is destroyed. And there are two responses. The, those that have put their stock in the empires of the world mourn and those that are faithful to God have a chance to rejoice because those things are passing away. This song made me think of that. God is watching us. God is got his eye on us. He watches the sparrow and he watches us. And that can be a source of celebration or perhaps a little bit of fear, depending on our relationship with God. God is not watching you to find out whether you trip up so that he can punish you. God is watching you because God loves you. And God has given us an opportunity to return a little bit of that love today in our offering. We'll ask the ushers to come forward and take it. Apparently it still works. If you would join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Lord, you love us and you give to us and your generosity is beyond our comprehension, your abundance. We don't have words for it. Lord, you do give us an opportunity to return to you a little of what you've given to us. So we thank you for this chance that we have to Give gifts to the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray that we would be faithful with them and that we would seek your kingdom with them. In all things, we give you the praise and the glory. In the name of your Son, amen. Thank you. Now, I'd like to invite the kids to come up. Thank you. People don't always make good decisions. <laughs> do you see what I have here? What do you think of this? We have some neighbors who are helping out. She's helping out her brother who's not feeling very well, but his dog had puppies, and so she said, I will help find homes for these puppies. And we thought, well, we don't have that, and so let's go ahead and say yes to one of these puppies. And let me tell you something. They're cute, aren't they? Are they cute? Are puppies cute? But let me tell you, puppies are not everything that they could be. If I just go blank today, it'll be because I have not gotten a lot of sleep over the last few days, and I'm feeling a little bit fuzzy, like she is. This is Cora, by the way. You want to pet her? Right now, Cora is in that wants to chew on everything, so she's real bitey, and she goes to the bathroom like all the time, and I have to take her outside even when it's dark, and she chases the cats. 
Puppies aren't everything that they are supposed to be. But let me tell you something. There isn't really a whole lot that is all that it could be. Do you guys see all the stuff that's going out in the hallways here? Did you see all the wallpaper that got taken down? Yeah. Yeah? Well, our church isn't everything that it could be right now either. Did you see all the construction out in the roadway out there with all the big equipment? Our road isn't everything that it could be either, right? Now, I want to call your attention. Take a look behind you. You see the globe back there? Do you see that back there, guys? You see the globe back there on the table? Our world isn't everything that it could be either. But let me tell you something. God loves us, and God's love is patient. And God is going to keep loving us until we are all that we can be. So I'm going to keep loving Cora until Cora is all that she can be, and we're all going to be patient and keep loving our church and our, everything around us until it's all it can be, and God is going to keep loving this world until it's all it can be. So, shall we pray together? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we are grateful that you are patient with us and that you love us even when we're not the best, even when we've got a ways to go. So we pray that you would just keep being patient with us and keep loving us so that we can be everything that you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, thanks, guys. Amen. 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 Yeah, I'm going to give them back to Cyrus. Huh? Oh, I'm going to give them to Tasha. You want to pet her? Okay, I can't hold on to her all the time, so... to the dog while you're preaching. <laughs> that puppy's very, very cute. We have a dog. He's about four years old, so he's older. He doesn't chew. He's a pretty nice dog, except, yeah. What? There's hope. No, I'm giving you my dog. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, you're way out there in the countryside. It'd be perfect place for my dog to go. <laughs> All right, let's stand and sing the song that is dear to my heart. Change my heart, O oh God. We all need to have our hearts open to the Holy Spirit as he searches through, sees what needs to be changed, what needs to be strengthened, mold me and make me.
example of a person, a woman whose heart was open to God, and he molded and shaped and made her a very, very special lady. When we first came, started coming to this church, she was one of the many of you who were so welcoming. But somehow she just really reached out and grabbed us. And it was very, very special. Floyd, she, she was a wonderful woman. I actually taught her granddaughter when he, she was in fifth grade. So, but I didn't know Mary then, just the parents, of course. But very special. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Here I Am to Worship is a song that we haven't sung for a long time. It's what I call one of the more modern songs. It was actually back in 2051. No, 2000. Just 2000. We haven't come to 2000. So let's try it, see how we do. When you commit to traveling through a book of the Bible, verse by verse, occasionally you come across verses that you would rather just skip over. This is one of them, but to be faithful, we're going to look at it. Beginning in the 10th chapter of Mark, at the first verse of that chapter, he, Jesus, left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And the crowds again gathered around him, and as was his custom, he again 
taught them. And some Pharisees came and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and then to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And as she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. I want to talk about Google Maps. To make everybody a little more comfortable, <laughs> maybe a little bit. Google Maps has a really neat feature in it. I don't know if you've, you've done this. You go online, you pull up Google Maps, and you can do this. It has, the feature is called Street View. And with Street View, you can zoom in to the map over a specific place, and you can drag this little icon of a little guy over and set him down in a spot on the map. Uh, and it'll show you a 360-degree view of that particular point, the spot that you've selected. It's like you're standing right there and you're just turning around and seeing everything that happens to be revealed at that point. Now, the purpose here, I think, is to let folks have landmarks and things. If you're driving through an area, you can actually look for this building or that tree or that source so you don't get lost. Um, but it also gives you a chance to, to see some places that maybe you wouldn't ordinarily get a chance to see. And so the other day, I zoomed in to Eagle Point Road in Peach Springs, Arizona. And I dropped my little person on this blue dot, and I took a look around. Now, there was a fairly nice parking lot there, uh, some nice flat ground, uh, some modern picnic tables, uh, a couple of those tension awnings that look like wings there for shade. And as you'd expect from Arizona, the view included a few desert plants, some sagebrush and some tumbleweeds. Um, there was a lot of red gravel and rocks and things, some boulders sticking out of the dry ground. Nice bright blue sky, and not, not a cloud in it. You can see these trash cans, these, those commercial ones you know that they have sometimes out in the desert. They're square and they got gravel on the sides and a little domed top. There were a few of those spread around. It looked pretty much like any other wide spot on the road, uh, a pullout, a rest stop somewhere, except that in the view, there was this sculpture, a big sculpture of a hand, and the hand had an index finger, and it was pointing at something behind me, 180 degrees in the other direction. And that's, again, the neat thing about Street View is that you can spin around virtually in that place and, and look in any direction. And so if you were to follow the directions of this pointing hand, you'd turn around and you'd see the Grand Canyon. You miss things when you're not looking in the right direction. Again, I can't help but have an illustration from Revelation here. We talked about the fourth chapter when John is ushered into the, the throne room of God and it's glorious and resplendent. And he would have missed all that if he had chosen to turn around and look the other direction. But we do that a lot. We end up looking the wrong way at things that we think are important and we miss what is really important. Now, you guessed already, I'm sure, this is not a message about the Grand Canyon. And so if you want to share stories about your trip there with the kids back in the day, you can do that later. But for right now, it's just an illustration. So we'll treat it as such. This message is about looking the wrong way. About having our attention on the wrong things and really missing what is at the heart of the matter. In Mark... 10, Jesus is continuing his journey to Jerusalem. We know where he's headed there. And along the way, though, he's doing what he normally does. He's teaching. The text even says it, as was his custom, he was teaching. 
And somewhere along the way, where he's, he's traveling along, some Pharisees come up to him and they ask him a question. And again, they don't really want to know information. They want to trap him. They want to test him. And the question that they ask is this. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, in some Bibles, the heading that is above this says, Teaching about divorce. I think that's looking in the wrong direction. A better heading might be teaching about marriage. But even that heading doesn't quite turn you all the way to where you need to be focused. You're not quite in the right direction. You see, at the heart of this passage is a question about God's sovereignty. So any accurate heading should have something in it that has to do with God's perfect will. The question that the Pharisees ask, it's focused totally on human concerns, whether this or that is lawful. It's what's known as an anthropocentric focus. Uh, that's just a $10 word that means human-centered, anthropocentric. What Jesus is trying to get his followers to do is to turn around and look in the right direction. Instead of human-centered thinking, human concerns, we should be theocentric. Another one of those $10 words that means what you might think it means, centered on God. You see, we need a big sculpture of a hand that's pointing us in the right direction, in the right way, and that's what Jesus does for us here. Don't look at that. Look at God instead. Now, this passage does contain a question about divorce, and so to be faithful, we need to look at that question. You see, the Pharisees wanted to know something, and it wasn't really so much about divorce. They wanted to know whether Jesus was going to line up with their traditions and their own teaching. And one of the most contentious matters in that day, uh, the ones that the, a question that they chewed on over and over, was this question of divorce. But you've got to understand where they are, their setting, to really understand the question. When Jesus returns their question with a question of his own, well, what did Moses command you? He gets right at the core of it. He goes right to the heart of this debate. You see, the problem was rooted in the interpretation of the law. Their response, that Moses required a certificate of dismissal, that comes from Deuteronomy 24. Um, and there it hangs on the reasons that one might divorce one's wife. The passage in Deuteronomy says this, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, then he can give her this certificate and send her packing. And the rabbis, the teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, they debated over and over and over again what this whole idea of displeasing and indecent, what do those things mean? What is displeasing and what is indecent so that we know when we can divorce our wife? Now, traditionally, that concept of indecent would have had some sexual connotation to it, most likely referring to adultery. And one school of thought said, yeah, that's it, adultery. Adultery is probably the only legitimate grounds for divorce. The other school of thought, well, they had a more open interpretation of this. Uh, basically, indecent was aligned a little more with that previous word of displeasing. A man could divorce his wife if she was a bad cook, if she wrecked the meal, if she burned the toast. I know, it seems ridiculous, but that's what it says. Another school went even further than that. They argued that displeasing was the actual focus, and displeasing meant that if you just liked the looks of another woman better, that was grounds enough. Now the question that the Pharisees asked, it had to do with which of these perspectives, which of these rabbinical schools that Jesus was going to align with, which, what is it that Jesus thought when he interpreted this law from Deuteronomy 24? But you see what Jesus does. He circumvents that whole Deuteronomy passage. He just goes right over it. He says it's not really about the Deuteronomy passage. He gets right to the heart of the matter. Instead of getting bogged down in that human-centered debate, he goes to Genesis. 
And it reminds them of God's plan. From the beginning of creation, he says, God made them male and female. Not God made men and then as an addendum, he threw women in there too. That is not how it went down. Male and female, two halves of a single whole, co-equal. So right away, Jesus is challenging the status quo of the patriarchy, this system that let men be in charge and did very little to protect the female part of creation. I don't know if you caught it. Did you notice it when we read these things? That Deuteronomy passage, the question the Pharisees asked, it is about what a man can do. Whether it is lawful for the man, the husband, to divorce his wife. Nothing about her. And then, as if to drive this point home, Jesus says, For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. This is radical stuff for these Pharisees. Instead of a woman leaving her family to join the man and his family to ensure that her husband has the offspring so that he can continue his lineage, that's what it was all about. In the original plan that God instituted, it was the man who left his family. It was the man who left his father and his mother and joined with his wife so that those two could become one, a single, independent unit not beholden to any sort of patriarchy or the demands of lineage. So in response to their question, Jesus spins the whole conversation. He reorients it. You see, it's not about what you think it's about, you Pharisees. It's not about the finer points of the law. It's not about certain rabbinical interpretations. It's all about what God wants. And what God wants is the two becoming one. And what God puts together, implying that these two become one as an act of God's will, no person, no better cook, no more attractive or accomplished potential mate, no pharisaical rule keepers, not even Moses, should separate them. God's plan is the right plan, the normative plan what we should go for. Everything else is less than, by definition. Jesus is doing a couple things here. One is in direct response to the question that the Pharisees ask. He wants to get some things straight about marriage and divorce. Now, he's not overly concerned here about checking a box or getting that right answer that's going to fulfill the Pharisees' expectations. They're thinking about this whole issue from that human-centered way. Jesus wants his followers to leave that behind and start thinking of marriage and the potential for divorce in a theocentric, a God-centered way. Their question, well, it's, the whole thing of it is framed in this patriarchal, men-in-charge sort of way that maintains the system of oppression. Jesus wants to do away with that and return to the way that God envisions marriage. Now one thing, to be clear, Jesus is not taking this stuff lightly. He's not dismissive of it. Now the verses that conclude our text for today, those last few verses that I would have probably really rather not talked about or just gone past, that private teaching that he offers the disciples later in the house, those shine a light on how seriously we need to take marriage. It's the difficult part of the passage because we all know that there are things that are worse than divorce. Jesus doesn't talk here about abuse. He doesn't talk about that emotional or, or, or physical abuse that can happen in relationships. Jesus doesn't talk about the difficulty that we all have in honoring our promises in this text. And Jesus doesn't say that Moses was wrong. What he does say is that divorce is a concession. 
I want you to grab a hold of that word and hang on to it. As Jesus noted, Moses allows this because of the hardness of their hearts. You see, the plan for marriage was that a woman and a man would leave their families and start one of their own, that the two would become one. It would be built on God's blessing. It would be sanctified by God. The plan was not that people would join, often for the benefit of one party at the expense of the other, only until something better comes along or until someone burns the toast. You see, the concession in Jesus' day was being abused as it often is today. You see, being allowed to do something, being permitted to do something is not the same thing as considering it normal or preferable. Matthew has an account of this same exchange. It's found in Matthew 19, and it, it qualifies that concession. There, Jesus allows for infidelity as grounds for divorce. But I think that looking at that, looking at the, that qualification, looking at what is permissible and what is lawful, that is exactly what the Pharisees are doing. That's a pharisaical action. It puts us in the same boat as they were in and looking in the wrong direction. Now, whether you want to line up with the hardliners, this school of Shammai, that's the rabbinical school uh, for the Jews, or you want to take a more permissive stance, that was the school of Hillel, we're still treating it as if divorce is the focus. There does need to be some guidance. Moses wasn't wrong to make this concession. But we need to quit giving that all of our attention. We shouldn't be paying so much attention to when things go wrong. We need to focus on when things are right. And shoot for that. I'm going to give an example here that goes beyond this text. God probably does not want us to get wrapped up in all the, unless you're a lawyer, but get wrapped up in all the different nuances of first-degree murder or second-degree murder or manslaughter or, or any of that. Those distinctions, those are important when things go bad, when things are wrong. They're necessary concessions. What God really wants us to focus on is loving each other, Right? Because if we're focused on loving each other, that should be considered as normative by God's standards. And if that's what we strive for and what we do, then we don't got to parse out the degrees of murder because it's not even an option. It's not even on the table. Don't worry about the distinction between coveting something and admiring it. Just be content with what you have. Don't, be, don't worry about those, the difference between those justifiable white lies and, and those malicious deceptions. Just tell the truth. Aim for the ideal. Aim for what God wants. Don't focus on the subtleties around the border of right and wrong. Commit so deeply to the right that wrong becomes a distant abstraction. In your rearview mirror, Turn your eyes towards what God wants, towards God, and there's less of the aberrations and the failures to distract us. I, I think this is what Jesus is getting at here. You see, the Pharisees appear to be concerned with just how close they can edge up to sin before they actually commit it. Where's the line they want to know? They want to know just how far this concession can go is it adultery or is it burned toast? It's this morbid fascination that we have with sin. How close can we get to it? What's, what's, what's the absolute limit of what I can do and still be considered righteous? And what Jesus seems to be saying is that focusing on marriage and what marriage is supposed to be, that is a lot more important than focusing on when marriages come apart. Instead of looking at the wreckage, turn around and look at what God wants it to be and strive for that. Now what I don't think Jesus is doing here is playing the Pharisees' game, creating a whole new hard and fast set of rules that govern the dissolution of marriage. I think he wants what God wants, the two to become one. And I believe that's important enough to him that he doesn't want to leave a legalistic loophole. If there is any hard and fast here, it really ought to be what God wants, right? Not something that we've created as a concession. 
there's an obvious tension here. On the one hand, Jesus is certainly drawing us into a position where we take marriage seriously. It should not be entered into lightly, as the, as the verbiage goes. First marriages in America last about as long as your average car ownership. I looked that up. We change our spouse about the same regularity as we change our ride. A little over eight years is what the average is. That is a long ways from two becoming one. But those statistics, they only tell one side of the story. We are not statistics. On the other side is all of that human brokenness. Our humanness that ruptures relationships. There's seemingly countless ways in which things could go wrong in a marriage since these two that are trying to become one are human creatures with all of their human faults. And so there's a complexity to this. Uh, one that, that it probably cannot be, no, I know, cannot be unraveled in a sermon. In fact, I'm not even sure a sermon is the best place to even try. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to cop out here. It's tough. And there's nuances and there's difficulties and there's forgiveness. I mean, think about it. Is it better for two people who are destroying each other to stay together just because of these verses? I don't know. Just because someone is faithful to the letter of the law, it does not mean that the, those two really have become one. And I think that the lesson here for us, it's not just when or if it's all right, lawful, to get a divorce. I think the lesson has a lot more to do with what God wants. You see, that's where Jesus draws the distinction between that pharisaical legalism, their way of looking at things, and God's pure intent. You see, the Pharisees are looking in the wrong direction. They're towards, looking towards what they can get away with, with and away from what God genuinely wants for them. And this is where the passage hits all of us, married, single, divorced, whatever. You see, we're all tempted by that same temptation to look away from what God wants and away from God. It's easier for us to make it up on our own, to cobble together some guardrails, some relative morality of our own design, and then call that righteous. You see, this is what Jesus has challenged all the way through. Not just here, but in other texts. The Sermon on the Mount is a great example. This idea that we could somehow keep the letter of the law and not pay attention to the heart of the matter. Jesus says, yeah, murder is wrong. <laughs> you get that. But, you know, hating your brother is just as wrong. He says, yep, adultery is wrong. But looking lustfully at others is just as wrong. He says, legally, you're only obligated to go a mile with someone who compels you, but true graciousness and love would lead you to do more. Jesus says, the heart of the matter is what matters. He says that that legalistic fence-tending misses the point. You see, if we're so focused on that margin between sin and what is legally justified, then we miss the core, the the center, that gleaming heart of what we are called to. God wants to draw us that way, towards perfection, towards holiness. He's not content to leave us hanging out here and just barely inside what's okay. It's why he tells us what marriage is really supposed to be and then forgives us when we fail to reach that ideal. You see, the point is not to figure out the, the barely inside acceptable margin, the border. The point is to draw closer to God's heart, closer to what God wants us to be. That's holiness. And becoming holy in marriage, in life, in all things, that is a process that we commit to and that we trust that God will bring to completion. And the only way we can do that is if we keep looking in the right direction. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we are weak and we are frail and we are cracked around the edges and we know this about ourselves. So for those times when we were willing to settle for just inside of okay, we ask your forgiveness. In whatever arena, whatever sphere, we recognize it as much broader than just this issue of marriage, but particularly in those kinds of relationships, Lord, when we were content to settle for just barely enough in our marriage, we ask your forgiveness. Help us draw closer to your heart, the heart that says two shall become one, because the closer we draw to you, the less concerned we need to be about those barely their borders. Help us to fix our eyes upon you and the author and the perfecter of our faith, your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So we need to draw near to God. We need to have our eyes focused on God. I can't think of a better way to do that than to share in communion. These elements that you'll receive, the bread and the cup, they are a reminder of Christ's body and his blood, and it's right there in your hands. It draws the mind and the heart closer to God, so it's a good thing to do this. But we don't want to do it without reflecting on our relationships, both with each other and with God, and so we're going to enter into a time of reflection, a time of prayer, preparing our hearts. We'll do that in silence, and then I'll close If you would bow with me. Lord God, in all things we want our focus to be on you. And in this time of silence and preparation, we have turned our eyes. We pray that you would bless this time. Amen. It began in this way. On the night that he was handed over, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We will serve the bread, and I ask that you hold it until all are served. We'll pray this prayer together, and then we'll take it together.
Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us even unto death. Send your spirit upon us so that we may know that all who eat and drink at your table in our congregation and around the world are one holy, one holy people. May we be inspired and equipped by this holy meal. The bread of life, Jesus' body, broken for you. Shall we take it together? After supper, Jesus took a cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let's pray together. Lord, give us clean hearts, forgiving hearts, praising hearts. As we drink this, we join with our brothers and sisters in heaven and on earth, giving thanks to you in an endless song of praise. May this cup remind us of your ever-flowing love. Amen. The blood of Christ was shed for you. You may take it. That's fine. This is a spiritual reality. And our physical, well, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we, we have a ways to go in God's plan for us. If you would, let's join together in this final reading. We have come to your table, Lord. And in taking the bread and the cup, we have received a spiritual, special gift in remembering, we have come close to you, and we have tasted your infinite love. 
May your spirit transform us from within so that we can see with Jesus' eyes, hear with Jesus' ears, speak with Jesus' mouth, feel the world as Jesus feels, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Lead us into the world, nourished by the bread of life. We pray in the name of the one who gave body and blood, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lots of noise when it tips over. <laughs> now let's stand and sing, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. much to be grateful for. If you would bow with me again. Lord, you have blessed us. We do want to give you thanks. We give you thanks for this time that we've been able to share in the bread and the cup. We thank you for the communion with you and with each other that it symbolizes. We thank you for the blessing of being a part of your family. But Lord, we know that that being a part of your family comes with responsibilities and so we ask that you would lead us into the world full of energy full of passion full of your love that we can share with others draw us closer to you and as we come close to you help us to share with the world that saving gospel we pray these things in the name of christ amen you may go in peace